So we're going to begin our discussion by looking at the biliary tract, and this includes its connection to the pancreatic ducts. So this uh, rather large structure right here, which holds the bile, is known as the gallbladder. And what you'll notice is it has a stalk right over here, which is known as a cystic duct. Now right above here, we have the common hepatic duct, which combines with the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. And so the common bile duct continues to go down, and then it combines with the pancreatic duct. And once, this, uh, once the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct come together, they come out through the, uh, or the bile comes out through the sphincter of Odin. Now, just to kind of give you an idea of where the gallbladder is positioned relative to other organs, um, up here we have the liver. And um, although this is very diagrammatic picture, what you'd actually see is that the gallbladder would be tucked under the liver and you'd only see a small piece of the gallbladder, uh, the, the, the uh, belly of it here, uh, would show. Um, the stomach wraps around the, uh, it wraps in front as far as the duodenum part, wraps in front of the common bile duct and then it wraps around, uh, you know, the duodenum um, and the sphincter of Odi enters into the second part of the duodenum. Finally, um, we also have the pancreas that I'm drawing here in yellow, um, which is where um, the uh, common bile duct also goes through. So let's take a moment to discuss the pathophysiology of calculus cholecystitis. Now, calculus cholecystitis refers to cholecystitis, which is inflammation of the gallbladder, secondary to a gallstone. So what happens in calculus cholecystitis is your liver makes the bile as it typically does, and then this bile continues to drain into the gallbladder. And, you know, in your gallbladder, you have a reservoir of bile, which is the normal uh, occurrence of your, of your gallbladder. And of course, every time you eat some fatty food, the gallbladder contracts and then it secretes the bile to help you know digest some of these fatty foods. However, in certain circumstances, like I mentioned in my uh, gall gallstones video, you can actually form a gallstone here in your gallbladder. And then as it's contracting, sometimes this gallstone can get lodged into your cystic duct. So the first you know, in calculus cholecystitis, the first thing that needs to occur is you have a gallstone obstructing the cystic duct. So once this obstruction happens, this leads to inflammation along the wall of the gallbladder. Now, if you remember, you know, whenever you have inflammation, you have a few things that occur. So whenever you have increased inflammation, of course, the first thing you have is edema. So you get some pericholecystic fluid that surrounds the gallbladder. Now, what also happens um, an interesting phenomenon, which is specific to the gallbladder, is you get an increase in prostaglandin. Now, it becomes important here because prostaglandin leads to increased contraction. So what you end up having is you have a gallstone that's lodged here in the uh, cystic duct. Um, and now you have increased contraction against the gallstone. And so this is inevitably, inevitably, going to lead to lots and lots of pain. And this is where the pain from cholecystitis comes from. Now, what you can also have in these circumstances is you can have a secondary infection. So once you have this inflammation um, and you can get local bacteria, which starts to proliferate, and so you can get lots of little microbes forming, and this can lead to a secondary infection in the gallbladder itself. Now, what can also happen is the gall, gallstone can lodge further, further down here into the common bile duct. Now, in this scenario, when it's here in the common bile duct rather than the cystic duct, this is no longer called cholecystitis. This is called cholecolithiasis, which means a stone in the common bile duct. This condition is treated differently than what we're talking about here, and I'm going to make a separate video for this. But just know the difference between cholecystitis, which is that stone lodged here, and cholecolithiasis, which means a stone in the common bile duct. So for secondary infection, the common microbes that occurs are primarily gram negatives. So you can get E. coli, enterococcus, enterobacter, and even klebsiella. Now, again, calculus cholecystitis occurs about 95% of the time. 5% of the times you can get a calculus cholecystitis. 
And so the name simply means cholecystitis without a stone. So it is possible to get inflammation and infection of your gallbladder without a stone present. So how can this happen? So one way it happens is anytime you have gallbladder stasis or ischemia. So if the gallbladder is just not contracting or you have decreased blood flow, which leads to ischemia, this can lead to inflammation of this wall as well. Now, the risk factors for this, one common risk factor is immunosuppressed state, such as patients with AIDS and leukemia. Another risk factor is anyone who's in critical condition, such as burn, septic shock patients, and patients who underwent cardiac arrest. Of course, these patients are very hypotensive, which can lead to decreased blood flow to the gallbladder. So this is something to consider in these very, very sick patients. Now, you can also get a primary infection of the gallbladder. Now, the primary infection is different than these microbes, because these microbes infect after you have the gallstone and then you have inflammation. These primary infections will in, can infect the gallbladder without the stone and without the underlying inflammation. So there are some parasites that cause it, such as uh, Ascaris and Echinococcus, but there's several bacteria that causes it. We have Brucella, Coxiella, um, you know, Cryptococcus, uh, I'm sorry, Cryptosporidium, Isospora. Um, we also have, uh, you know, uncommon in the United States, but you can get uh, TB, Salmonella, and Vibrio. And then on top of all these, there are some common viruses that cause it, such as cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis A virus, and hepatitis B virus. So I want to, you know, although this is very rare, I do want you guys to be familiar with the, uh, the, the manner in which you can have cholecystitis without an actual stone presence. When learning about cholecystitis, it's important to have a strong understanding of the complications that may develop so you can watch for them. And it makes you appreciate why cholecystitis needs to be treated in a very timely fashion. Um, the most common complication that occurs is gangrenous cholecystitis. And as the name suggests, this is when the wall of the gallbladder becomes necrotic. Um, this occurs in about 20% of cases. The most common risk factors for developing gangrenous cholecystitis is elderly, so very old age, diabetes, and it happens very commonly in those who delay seeking treatment or if you delay giving treatment if they're under your care. And this is one of the reasons why we try to treat cholecystitis so quickly and why it's an emergency is because we want to prevent this very catastrophic complication. Now, patients can also develop sepsis. Now, typically when I see a patient with sepsis whose, uh, whose blood culture grows gram negative, but their urine is normal, one of the things that I like to do is take a look at that gallbladder because maybe that gram negative bacteria is coming from the gallbladder rather than the typical place where you find it, which is in the urine. So again, just, just to kind of reiterate, um, cholecystitis can eventually lead to sepsis, which again is very, very dangerous. It's a high mortality. The other complication is perforation. So as the name suggests, this is when the gallbladder just kind of opens up and, and releases its contents. Um, this is typically a comp, you know, this happens 10% of the time and it's typically a complication after gangrenous cholecystitis. So when a patient typically gets gangrenous cholecystitis at a focal point, eventually the wall breaks down and then you get a perforation. Um, oftentimes you can get a, what's called a pericholecystic abscess, which is actually palpable when you palpate the abdomen. So this is a sign that you can also look for when you're uh, doing a physical examination. Finally, you can get a full-on free perforation. Um, this is when the actual contents do spill into the peritoneum, and in these patients, you get generalized peritonitis. Um, and this is a typical sign that you want to look for in patients who, who you su suspect have a pre -per -per free perforation. If someone does have a free perforation, that is associated with a very high mortality. So this is something you definitely want to first avoid. And if the patient does have it, you want to make sure that you recognize it and treat it immediately. 
Another form of complication is known as emphysematous cholecystitis. So emphysematous cholecystitis is when the patient gets infection of the gallbladder wall with a gas forming bacteria. And so what the patient will typically have is gas in the actual wall of the gallbladder. And this can be seen oftentimes on ultrasound. The common bugs that will cause this is E. coli, uh, staph, strep can also uh, cause this, and you can get uh, Pseudomonas as well as Klebsiella. So these, so these are the most common ones. Now, a very interesting physical finding that you might find in patients with emphysematic cholecystitis is abdominal crepitus. And so what this generally feels like is when you palpate the abdomen, you'll feel kind of a uh, like, like you're touching paper, like a crinkly sound. And so if you hear that or you feel that type of feeling, this is something you want to be aware of, especially if the patient seems very, very sick. Finally, you can get bowel obstruction. Now, how does gallbladder, you know, cholecystitis lead to bowel obstruction? Well, in many patients, who, especially if they have long-standing uh, cholecystitis, they can develop a cholecystoenteric fistula. So this is a fancy word for saying that there's a tract between the gallbladder and the actual intestines. Now, you can also get a cholecystocolonic fistula, which is a tract between the gallbladder and colon. However, in order to get bowel obstruction, it has to be cholecystoenteric fistula. So, you know, before you can get bowel obstruction, you first need to develop that fistula. Then you need to develop a stone, which is at least two and a half centimeters. And when this stone goes through the fistula, it gets obstructed near the ileocecal valve. And once you have that obstruction, it blocks your, you know, bl blocks the, uh, the small intestines and the patient will get a bowel obstruction. So these are the common complications of cholecystitis. Um, these, again, you, you definitely want to be aware of, and these are the reasons why you're, we treat these very quickly and, and we treat them uh, as, as an emergency. Primary symptom for cholecystitis will be pain. The typical pain that's described is in the right upper quadrant and it extends up to the midline. Um, oftentimes you should remember that this can cause chest pain, retrosternal chest pain. So when you have a patient with you know chest pain, uh, cholecystitis is on the differential. Um, oftentimes you'll also get patients who will complain that it's radiated to their back. So, so here in the back you do have that symptom and of course it also you have referred pain to the upper right shoulder which extends all the way to the back over the scapula and it can go even up to the uh, between the shoulder blades. The typical description of the pain is the pain is fairly persistent. Um, it lasts anywhere from four to six hours and they'll typically say that it's associated with any type of a fatty meal. So they'll say you know, whenever I eat a burger, I get these, I get these symptoms, or any other type of really big fatty meal, they'll, that'll trigger these symptoms. Of course, that's not all they have. They also get fever, nausea, vomiting. They appear pretty ill, and they have tachycardia. And these are, these are important symptoms to help you differentiate between a patient who's just merely having gallstones with someone who probably has cholecystitis. So these are very key symptoms that you need to uh, elicit from your patient to kind of get the idea of what you're dealing with because of course the management uh, is, is going to be slightly different. Now what will you notice on examination? So oftentimes patients will have peritoneal symptoms. Um, this does occur. Then, so they have the typical signs where they, you know, anytime they move they feel pain. So whenever you see this, this, this excessive of any type of, some type of peritoneal irritation. And a lot of times these patients will have voluntary and even involuntary guarding. So uh, it's important to elicit these symptoms whenever you see it. Um, the famous sign is going to be Murphy's sign. This is uh, very classic for cholecystitis. So, you know, what is Murphy's sign? So real quick, I can draw a little uh, human here. Um, and then, of course, here's a, here's a liver. And so one thing you have to remember is, the liver abuts the lung, so the liver is right below the lung. And of course, as you have the liver, you know you have a little piece of the gallbladder showing there, 
And if the patient has cholecystitis, well, then it will even be inflamed. So that's a little bit of inflammation there shown by the red line. So in, in a typical situation, what you'll do is you'll go ahead, you'll take your hand, and you'll push it underneath the rib cage. So you'll barely be able to get in the rib cage. At this point, you won't be able to touch the gallbladder. But then you ask the patient to inhale. And when they inhale, the lung expands, pushing the gallbladder uh, lower. And when that occurs, the gallbladder, which is inflamed, touches the tip of your finger, and the patient will catch their breath. And that's the key sign. Of course, they're going to feel pain, but one of the key things you want to look for is they'll stop their breath midway because they immediately realize that it's my breathing that's causing the pain. So they will, it will, they will stop breathing midway. And that's the classic Murphy sign. Now, just, uh, just so we can just continue here, there's, there's very important to look at a lot of labs. Typically, you'll have a high white count, possibly with bands. So that's, that's uh, also concerning for cholecystitis. However, what you also want to look for is a few other things. You also want to measure the bilirubin and the ALP. The reason is, is because in cholecystitis, these shouldn't be very elevated. Because remember, the gallstone is in the cystic duct. It shouldn't affect necessarily the common bile duct or the hepatic duct. And generally, when you have an elevated bilirubin, that can be a sign of some sort of obstructive uh, hepatitis. And so this will raise more concern for like a cholangitis or cholecystitis. On top of that, you also want to take a look at the liver function test. Again, with in, in an uncomplicated cholecystitis, these should, these should be normal. The liver shouldn't be affected. And if they are, this is more suggestive of something else might be going on with the common bowel duct. So these are important labs to look at. So the first line workup for cholecystitis, and in general, you know, right upper quadrant pain, is to do a right upper quadrant ultrasound. It's very safe, easy to do, uh, no complications, and it actually gives you a very good visualization of the gallbladder and even the liver. So typically when you uh, see the gallbladder on the ultrasound, uh, you go into two different phases. One is going to be the longitudinal view and the other is going to be the transverse. So the longitudinal view, you have a cut from the side, um, so you're seeing the entire gallbladder from the side, and here you're cutting it and so it looks like a circle shape. So what are the primary features that, will, that you see in the um, ultrasound? That'll suggest that maybe you're dealing with cholecystitis versus just a gallstone. Well, the first thing is you get a very thickened wall, usually greater than about three millimeters. So here in the longitudinal section, this is the what I'm drawing that line here. This is the inside of the wall, and then you can, you know, just as as just to give you an idea, here is the outside of the wall. So you can see this is fairly thick in certain areas, especially you know right here. And over here, this is suggesting that there's some inflammation and cholecystitis. And um, if, at least in this uh, view, um, the transverse, you can see the uh, wall even better. So here you have the inside of the wall, and this here is a lot of sludge, which is also suggestive that there's you know some type of pathology going on. And then you have another you know kind of the outline border here, and so you can see on this view, um, the the wall looks much more thickened in this case. Um, the other thing that is suggestive of cholecystitis is pericholecystic fluid. So again, here in the transverse view, you have some here at the bottom. Um, it's, you know, you can see some pericholecystic fluid, and then I guess you can also see some here right at the uh, top, the fundus area here. And in the um, transverse, I think we have some right about here. So this kind of gives you an idea of what the pericholecystic fluid looks like. Now. Although these are very suggestive of cholecystitis, um, the two main features that really, you know, that are found to be very sensitive and specific with regards to ultrasound findings is one is the actual finding the gallstone. Um, so, for example, here we can actually see the gallstone, and here you can see the acoustic shadow. So this actually shows you the gallstone, and then oftentimes the ultrasound tech will look up into the cystic duct and see if they can find the gallstone there as well. So that's a very, very specific and sensitive finding. Um, the other finding is um, sonographic Murphy sign. And this is kind of, you know, it tells you, it pretty much means what it says. 
that same Murphy sign that you do on examination, well, remember the ultrasound tech is going to put the probe right in about the same area. So if they elicit a uh, Murphy sign just with the probe, that's actually very sensitive and specific. So these two signs are actually more sensitive and specific than these two findings. So um, this is one of the reasons why ultrasound techs will will take some time to really try to find that gallstone because that helps you uh, in, in, in making, making you more confident in the results of the ultrasound saying it's cholecystitis. There are some other things you want to make sure you look for uh, when, you're, when you do an ultrasound. One is the size of the common bile duct. The reason is is because, you know, technically if it's pure cholecystitis and that gallstone is lodged primarily in the cystic duct, well, there should be no impact on the common bile duct. So if you see that, it, you know, it, you look at the common bile duct and it's greater than six millimeters, that's suggesting that maybe there's some involvement of the actual common bile duct. So maybe you're actually dealing with the cholecholothiasis. Now, although this is suggestive, this isn't necessarily confirmatory. You got to confirm this. Um, however, the bigger the common bile duct size is, the more the more you can have faith in that um, you have some clinical orthiasis. So oftentimes, you know, whenever you read a report, make sure you look at that common bile duct size. And if it seems larger, then you might want to think about doing a little bit of a workup for clinical orthiasis. The other thing to look for is identifying emphysematous cholecystitis. So in emphysematous cholecystitis, oftentimes you're going to end up seeing some air here in the gallbladder wall. However, one caveat is oftentimes, um, although you see air in the gallbladder wall, it's difficult to figure out where it's coming from. So oftentimes it'll get mistaken for air in the overlying, uh, ab above the gallbladder. And so it might just think that the patient just has gas in his bowel. So sometimes it is difficult to distinguish between bowel gas versus air in the gallbladder wall. So if you know if you're looking at a patient, they seem pretty sick, um, you're worried about you know very severe form of cholecystitis, and you see the you know the tech write you know overlying bowel gas, which they typically will write, you may start to think, you know what, maybe it's not overlying bowel, bowel gas, but maybe there's that's actually air inside the actual gallbladder wall. And so that will of course you know change uh, not necessarily change your management, but make you make the situation more serious than what it is. So after the ultrasound is performed, sometimes you can get equivocal results or other times, you know, clinically you're very suspicious. The labs kind of look like cholecystitis, but you know, the, the ultrasound is normal. And another follow-up test that can be done is known as the HIDA scan. So the word HIDA refers to hepatic immunodiacetic acid scan. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as colocentigraphy. So this scan takes, makes use of a dye, um, technetium-99. So to explain exactly what happens to this dye, let me start off by drawing a quick diagram here. So in this diagram, you know, of course, we're going to have our liver uh, in this area, and then, you know, the gallbladder is, you know, tucked under the liver right here. Um, you know, and then of course we have the, you know, we'll drop the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum, and of course the gallbladder drains into the duodenum right there. So this is a very diagrammatic look. And again, again, very diagrammatic, but of course we have the, you know, a veins, um, you know, come from the arm. Eventually they make it to the liver, of course not directly, but you know, this just kind of shows eventually it makes it there. So the HIDA scan begins first by injecting the patient with technetium-99. So the, the, the technetium-99 gets injected usually into the forearm, uh, one of the veins, or if they have a saline lock, it'll be pushed through there. Eventually, this dye goes, of course, goes through the venous system, gets into the arterial system, but eventually, one way or another, it makes it into the liver, and the liver takes it all up. So the hepatocytes will take up this technetium-99, and the first thing that you'll see in the scan is the entire liver lights up. Then the hepatocytes go ahead and process this, this technetium-99. And then eventually you'll see um, after 30 to 60 minutes, it gets secreted into the, bile, uh, the common hepatic duct. And, it gets go and if the cystic duct is patent, 
you'll visualize the gallbladder. But that's only if the cystic duct is patent. Now, if you have a blockage in this area right here, then you're, this, this, the dye will not make it into the gallbladder. So over time, what begins to happen is the liver first lights up, but then after a while, it goes dim. And then the, all the uh, hepatocytes, that means all the hepatocytes have pushed the technetium-99 through their intrahepatic, uh, intrabiliary ducts and into the common hepatic duct. And so you'll, then what you'll see is you'll see the common hepatic duct light up. Shortly afterwards, um, if the cystic duct is patent, like I mentioned earlier, it'll light up the big uh, gallbladder. Now, of course, it couldn't do that. If there was a blockage right here, the dye would not be able to come in here. So that means that you will, you will not be able to visualize the gallbladder. So visualization of the gallbladder rules out, absolutely rules out, any type of obstruction in the cystic duct and therefore rules out calculus cholecystitis. And of course, the dye doesn't stop there. The dye, is continu the dye continues down the biliary tract and then it lights up the uh, duodenum and oftentimes lights up the stomach. So this is diagrammatically what happens. Let me show you an actual scan here. So this is an actual scan um, and this shows over time what's going on. So you can see here um, the dye has been injected. You can see, you know, going through the veins, uh, some of the other organs, but you can really see the liver starting to light up. So this is the hepatic phase. Um, and then the, the liver is getting darker. And then you can see, you can even see here the intrahepatic biliary ducts going on here. And now you can see the, the gallbladder forming. So, and over time, what you see is the liver is not as bright. You start to see a lot of the biliary tract is more brighter. And then here you can see a beautiful... Um, gallbladder right here. So this is a normal HIDA scan. Now this again should take more than no more than 30-60 minutes. Now if it lasts longer than 30-60 minutes um, there's actually something you can do which is known as morphine augmentation. So of course is you know morphine ha is known to cause uh, to cause constriction of the sphincter of OD and so when you have that it can increase the backflow. It, for example if it might not be light, lighting up here just because it's choosing to go down here. But by closing this up, this will increase the backflow into the gallbladder. And that can speed up the exam. However, you should give it anywhere between three to four hours before you give it a negative test because sometimes um, that's how long it takes uh, before you say that you know this patient has cholecystitis. However, if you do the morphine augmentation test and after three to four hours, you're not seeing the gallbladder. Um, you, you don't vi visualize the gallbladder at all in either scenarios. That is pretty much clinches your diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. So non-visualization of the gallbladder on HIDA scan is a diagnostic for acute cholecystitis, a uh, calculus cholecystitis, as a matter of fact. So here is a scan here. Um, you can see again, um, you can see the liver very nicely, but here you can see that the gallbladder, you know, the, you can see the drug and duct and is going straight into the, uh, a little hard to tell, it's probably going down here, up and around um, into the uh, duodenum and, and stomach. So we don't see a gallbladder here. And so therefore this is a test saying that this patient's cystic duct is blocked. So you can say that with confidence. However, there are some uh, false positives to be aware of. First, anyone with severe liver disease and so this makes sense because if you have severe liver disease, in order for this test to work, the liver has to be functioning because it needs to process the technetium-99 and excrete it into the bile. Um, and so, for example, if you have no uptake, then you're not, this test is going to be false positive. However, you will know because, of course, you, know, you, you first see this liver becoming uh, darker. That usually won't happen in severe liver disease. Second thing is anyone who's in a fasting state or they're taking TPN, this can also lead to a false negative. False positive, sorry. And that's because when someone's fasting, their gallbladder hasn't contracted in a while and it could be, it could be full of bile. And so when the, when the bile comes in, there's just no room for the marker to, 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 to go into the gallbladder. So typically, if you don't have a contraction of the gallbladder for a while, that can lead to a full gallbladder. Um, and then you just don't, you just, the, 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 the uh, technetium 99 can't be uh, pulled in. Also, anybody with um, 
a biliary sphincterectomy, um, these patients will also tend to um, not have, uh, will have a false positive, sorry. And that's because when you have a biliary sphincterectomy, what that means is there's, there's no valve here. And so this area can be very, very loose. And so what tends to happen when, 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 you have, when this area is very loose is the, the bile, they prefer to go down because this is the path of least resistance rather than go into the gallbladder. So this is one thing that you need to be aware of. And so again, the, the bile just prefers to go to the uterine rather than the gallbladder just because of the pressure differences. And finally, um, any high bilirubin. So if, if the patient has uh, some type of intravascular hemolysis, you need to elevate bilirubin. Um, and that's just because the you know decreased clearance. So your, your um, liver is focused on the bilirubin, so it won't be able to uptake and process the technetium 99. And it's, it's as simple as that. Now, other uh, scans that you might want to do, um, CT abdomen is commonly performed. Um, however, this is not going to help you diagnose cholecystitis per se. Um, it will help you rule out other complications of cholecystitis, such as a perforation, and you can even sometimes detect the infosomatis uh, cholecystitis by looking at air in that gallbladder wall. And of course, the patient doesn't have pain in his abdomen. Um, it can help you rule out other possible causes of pain that the patient may be having. MRCP is another study um, we will get to in the clinical lithiasis video. Sometimes this is performed um, because the patient might be having a concurrent clinical lithiasis. So just because they have a positive HIDA scan doesn't mean they don't have clinical lithiasis. So th th this is sometimes performed if you really suspect that. And the typical thing that makes us suspicious of clinical lithiasis is lab work. So the patient has elevated LFTs or bilirubin, or they have a dilated common bile duct on that ultrasound that, that we discussed. Because again, although common dilated common bile duct on ultrasound is suggestive of, um, of, of a clinical lithiasis, it's not diagnostic. So sometimes you might want to do an MRCP after that just to make sure the patient doesn't have clinical lithiasis because that's something that might be treated um, much more differently. After you've diagnosed a patient with cholecystitis, the next step is to actually manage the patient. Initial management is primarily supportive care. Um, keep in mind that these patients have had a fever, oftentimes vomited multiple times, probably not eating well. So the first step is hydration. And these patients will also most likely be uh, undergoing surgery. And so um, being in a well hydrated state is actually uh, improves outcome for surgery. So first step is always hydration. Again, food doesn't really help them much on the vomiting, uh, it worsens the pain. So generally you keep them NPO. Sometimes, you know, if, if it's really bad, um, you know, and you need to decompress the, uh, the stomach because they keep vomiting, you can do an NG too, but that's not, you know, typically what occurs. Generally, just keep them NPO and, and hydrate them. They're going to be in pain. Um, analgesics is a good idea. Remember, we talked about prostaglandins playing a role. So NSAIDs are helpful, but if there's any contraindications, renal disease or bleeding, uh, opioids is also an option. Um, but that's definitely going to be second line. So shoot for the NSAIDs first. The next question is the topic of antibiotics. So as you're already familiar, um, people with cholecystitis can have a secondary infection. Um, it's actually quite common. Um, so if they have uncomplicated cholecystitis and fairly low risk factors, meaning they're 25 years old, fairly healthy, no real issues, the, whether or not to give antibiotics is still debatable. Some surgeons will give, some surgeons won't, and they cite a lot of meta-analysis and studies that have shown that there's no difference, um, whereas others still have advocated for it. However, if this is complicated, or if you have a patient with a lot of risk factors, you know, uncontrolled diabetes, heart failure, all these things, then it's not a debate. You give antibiotics, and you give until they actually perform the cholecystectomy. So this is important to remember. So which antibiotics do you give? Um, so remember, we're going to be covering for gram-negative and anaerobes. So you got to give cover, something that covers that, basically GI bugs. Uh, as this thing. So you can, you know, you can do a really good job with covering the anaerobes with flagell. Um, you, can, you know, the gram-negatives can be covered with cefepime or ceftazidine, or you can even go for fluoroquinolone, such as levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin. So uh, again, a lot of GI bugs, you give ciproflagell. That's common. 
I try to stay away from fluoroquinolones whenever I can, just because of the QT syndrome. Um, you know, that's kind of always in the back of my mind, especially if they have like history of psych meds or something like that. So, you know, cefepine flagell, um, ciproflagell, these are common uh, regimens that are prescribed. If they're a little sicker um, and you're a little bit more concerned, um, it's, uh, it's also common, you know, it's also reasonable at that point to give zosin or ertapenem. And this is particularly I'll give if I'm kind of worried about sepsis, you know, lactic acid is a little bit elevated or, you know, they're hypertensive and, and I kind of want to give stronger things. Or, or maybe they have higher risk factors and, you know, you, you're concerned about other possible infections as well. Um, then I then I kind of go broader with zosin or ertapenem. But again, try to stay as narrow as possible uh, with the flagell and then, you know, either the one of the cephalosporins or the uh, fluoroquinolones. Um, consider vancomycin. Um, the only time you want to consider vancomycin if you think that it's hospital required. So the vancomycin is specifically if you think that the patient um, has some type of hospital required infection of the gallbladder. So generally a lot of patients will do better with the supportive care um, and then you can plan for some type of uh, elective surgery. However, um, there are certain times where you're going to need to do emergency surgery. So emergency cholecystectomies are typically performed in two scenarios. The first, if it's complicated. So any patient who has cholecystitis and they show any evidence of gangrene or perforation, that's immediately going to the OR. That's, that's uh, not, a, not a difficult decision to make. However, if you have a patient with an uncomplicated cholecystitis, majority will be, you know, you receive, you do the supportive care, and then they'll be on their way. However, if the disease is still progressing, they're not getting better. And what I mean by not getting better is persistent fever, white count still elevated, they still got pain. Um, these patients will require an emergency cholecystectomy. And, by, and usually that means within the next few days. So if patients have fairly low risk, you know, they're low risk patients, which means they don't have many comorbidities, they don't, uh, you know, they may have diabetes, but it's well controlled or mild CHF. Those types of patients, they're not really uh, high risk for surgery. Uh, generally, what you do is you resuscitate them and then do the surgery, usually within three days. So typically, you don't want to go after three days if they're low risk. However, some patients are really high risk. Um, these are typically patients who are, you know, have a high BMI greater than 40. Um, they have severe CHF, end stage renal disease, very uncontrolled diabetes. All these patients, they are very high risk for having complications during the surgery. Um, not only that, but sometimes some type of comorbidity. So, you know, patients with um, DIC, ARDS, severe sepsis, if they have a lot of other issues going on, um, these patients are also considered high risk. Among these patients, um, mortality is around 19%. So these patients are very, very high risk for surgery. So what do you do in this case? Um, typically what you can do is you can do what's called a gallbladder drainage. So the purpose of a gallbladder drainage is you take a tube, stick it into the gallbladder and take out a lot of the bile. And what this does is it decompresses the bile and removes a lot of the infection, which decreases inflammation. Then you remove the gallbladder later when they're feeling, you know, a little bit better or when you've controlled their CHF or, you know, whatever the other uh, things may be. So there's two ways to drain the gallbladder. Um, one is percutaneous and percutaneous just means you go directly through the skin. And then the other is actually through an ERCP. So an ERCP, you take a scope down their uh, uh, mouth through the esophagus into the stomach. Um, and then you go ahead and once you get to the duodenum, uh, you put in a little drain and then it'll drain it'll drain into the uh, GI tract. So this is typically done pretty much just until the you know if they have if they're in uh, sepsis you just kind of wait till the sepsis kind of gets improves and then you can take out the gallbladder later um, and, and that's typically what we do. Now as any procedure there are definitely complications associated with cholecystectomy. Um, first and foremost, bleeding. So this is a very common for any procedure. Um, a lot of times, you know, surgeons can nick a vessel or not cauterize or whatever the issue may be, and these patients can bleed. Um, related to the bile, they can have um, bile duct injury. Um, and a lot of times, bile duct injury means that they end up having a bile leak. Now, bile is very, very strong irritant to the peritoneum. So these patients will be in a lot of pain. So bile leak is very, very serious complication of uh, 
uh, cholecystectomy. A lot of times when the surgeon is in there, he can hit bowel, they can get bowel injury, get ileus, um, so that's also something to watch out for. Um, a lot of times you remove the you removed the gallbladder, but they had a stone in the common bile duct that went unnoticed, or maybe the stone passed through the cystic duct later, and so you have a common bile duct stone, and then the patient has to undergo an ERCP procedure. Finally, there's one uh, syndrome called post-cholecystectomy syndrome, and these patients will typically continue to have the symptoms of cholecystitis even though they don't have gallbladder. And this is typically due to uh, issues regarding uh, biliary dyskinesia, where the where the bile ducts are just not contracting well to push push through the uh, bile, or the uh, sphincter of OD dysfunction. Uh, that's also been attributed to that. So this is something also to look for, especially in patients who perform the surgery, but they're still not getting better. You know, regarding the how the procedure is done, that's usually uh, not asked in in the steps. That's a very uh, surgical residency type question, so I'm not going to go into that, um, but you should be familiar with uh, the indications, um, low risk, high risk, and the complications uh, of uh, cholecystectomy when emergency cholecystectomy should be performed. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the future ones. Have a great day.